Here's a message by Dr. Ray Hughes entitled, What Shall Happen When Jesus Comes? Heavenly Father, we do give thanks to you tonight for all the benefits of your divine grace, for how you've helped us so much. Lord, now we come to the preaching of your word, and we want you to grip the hearts of men and women here. Cause your name to be praised. Don't let a mother's boy or a mother's girl go to hell from this camp meeting. Don't let a sick body leave here without being touched. Don't let anyone struggling with the flesh leave without a sanctifying portion of your spirit. Don't let anyone who feels that emptiness leave without being filled with your spirit, baptized in your Holy Ghost. Oh God, you know how to move in to a service like this and do your mighty and powerful work. O oh, thou who art from everlasting to everlasting, Thou art he who changes not now. We just throw ourselves on you unreservedly, unconditionally, totally, saying this is yours. Do with it what you will and what you can. Amen and amen. What shall happen when Jesus comes. First, I want to biblically affirm, reaffirm, and establish that Jesus Christ is coming again. In 2 Peter 1 and 16, For we have not followed coming to devise fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. The apostle Peter said that he and James and John were eyewitnesses of the majesty of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, the voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. When they were on the mount of transfiguration and there appeared there Moses and Elijah. Moses was a type of the resurrected saints that should come out of the grave. And then Elijah, Elijah was a type of the translated saints that would be transformed, that would be called up to meet the Lord in the air. And then Jesus was caught up on a cloud with blistering white garments like he is going to come in the clouds of heaven. And there was a voice from heaven as there will be a voice from heaven at the rapture. This is a perfect setting of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter said, it's not a fable. said, we saw it. All of us saw it. We saw it on the Mount of Transfiguration just like it's going to be when He comes in the clouds of heaven, when He comes in the clouds of glory. So it's not a fable. There are a lot of people that will tell you that it's a fable. But the prophets foretold the coming of the Lord. In Jude verse 14 it said, Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied, Behold, He cometh with ten thousands of His saints. Just think, the seventh man from Adam before Jesus Christ was ever born, before He ever came into the world, prophesied that Jesus is going to come again. And then in the book of Genesis, Moses said that the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his legs, until Shiloh come. 
Hallelujah. He prophesied that Shiloh was going to come way back in the Genesis, which means the beginning. And then we read about the son of David. He said, when the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in glory. In other words, when Zion is built up and when Israel is restored and Israel goes back, he said, then the Lord shall appear in glory. Hallelujah. And then Jeremiah said, he shall roar out of Zion. Isaiah said, he shall come like a whirlwind. Haggai said the nation shall shake and the desire of all nations shall come. Habakkuk said that his vision is yet for an appointed time at the end it will speak and it will not lie and though we tarry wait for it for it will surely come and it will not tarry. The prophets prophesied that Jesus Christ will come again and then Jesus himself said in John 14 and 3 I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there ye may be also all of the parables that Jesus gave concerning his coming like in Luke 19 and 13 he said occupy till I come he said blessed is he that is a, a soul doing when he comes and as the word of God tells us uh, time and time again that be all so ready for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man come. Jesus said that himself. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible said, let God be true, but every man a liar. It's his promise. And the Bible said in 2 Peter 3 and 19, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he's long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now the Bible doesn't say he's not slack concerning his promises. He isn't slack concerning his promises. But he said his promise. What was he talking about? He's talking about the coming again. He promised that he would come back. And he's coming back again in the clouds of glory. And Hebrews 10, 36 and 37. We have need of patience that after we have done the will of God, we might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come. And he will not tarry. I want you to know, my friend, he has not delayed his coming. The scoffers of the world are saying, where is the promise of his coming? But I want you to know it's on schedule. He is the one who he said he would come again. He will come again. When he departed from this world after speaking to his disciples, and the angel said, Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus that is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. The angel spoke it. That's another angel or the same angels at the tomb said about Jesus Christ. Said he is not here. He is arisen. In Hebrews 2 and 2 it said the word spoken by the angel angels were steadfast in every transgression and disobedient receive a just recompense of reward. What are you saying, Brother Hughes? If the angel that announced the birth of Jesus Christ was true, if the angel that said that Jesus Christ had arisen from the dead was true, if the angel that said he's taken up in the heaven and he shall so come in like manner was true also. Oh, hallelujah. Because the word spoken by the angels, the Bible said, was steadfast. It's truth. And he is coming again in the clouds of glory for his very own. Can you say, praise the Lord? Now, but we don't really believe that in many quarters. There are a lot of people who don't believe that. And we don't believe it because of this. Because of our lifestyle. Our lifestyle belies what we say we believe. Somebody help me preach. He that hath this hope in him does what? Purify himself. Even as he is. In other words, if you really believe he's coming, you've got this hope in you, you, you live a pure life. 
separated from the world, set apart unto God, holy, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The Bible said, He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk as even as he walked. And the Bible said, They that are Christ have crucified themselves with their affections and lusts. Amen. So if you have this hope in you, there's going to be a certain lifestyle that you're keeping. And that lifestyle is not a permanent lifestyle in many of the churches today. We are bogged down. We're caught up in the net of this world. We're snared. We're like Isaiah said, we're like a wild bull in a net. The world, like a magnet, is holding us down. Our affection is set on the things of the world and not on the things of the earth. But he said, set your affection up on things above and not on the things of the earth. For we are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ to his our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Amen. 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 That's what God's word has to say about it. You see, the second reason we're really not expecting him to come is the passiveness that exists. A spirit of unexpectancy. And he said he'll come in such an hour as you think not. And if you were to ask, oh, even this church group here tonight, do you believe Jesus Christ is coming tonight? And many of them say, well, I haven't thought about it today. I had thought about that. You know, when I first came into the church of God, one of the things that struck me so forcibly, everybody was occupied with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were occupied with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I heard messages in tongues and interpretations, and they talked about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where are those today? You listen to what I'm saying, my good friend. The, one of the first songs that I ever heard sung was, Oh, I want to see him. Look upon his face. Let us sing forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory. Let me lift my voice. Catch all past home at last. Ever to rejoice. And they were singing when the roll is called up yonder. I'll be there about 60 miles an hour. And the, their minds were set on heaven. It looked as though they were about to explode. And it looked as though angels set on their faces. And their voices lost their moral tones. Because they were living with their hearts in heaven and with their hope of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The third reason why we're not looking for Him to come is there is a lack of evangelism in our midst. Our sons and daughters could go to hell right around our feet, and we don't seem to be that much disturbed about it. Relatives can be lost. And we don't seem to be that much disturbed about it. And I want to tell you, if you really believe that Jesus Christ were coming and that he could come this very night, you'll be doing something about getting people to Jesus Christ and getting them saved. When the coming of the Lord is old hat to you, and when the coming of the Lord doesn't any charm you any longer, and when the coming of the Lord doesn't stir you, and when the coming of the Lord doesn't occupy your thinking, then you've lost the vision of his return. And when you lose the of his return, you drop to the level of a brute and begin to live according to the lusts of the flesh and according to this world. But when you set your affection on things above and you've got your eyes on the heaven, your elbows on heaven's windowsills, you're looking for his return. It'll change the concept of life. Oh, bless the Lord. The Lord is coming again. He is coming with power and great glory. Tune your hearts. Prepare your souls. Walk in the paths of righteousness for my name's sake. Let your soul be burdened for those around you. For I will come again 
and my promise is true. Can you say praise the Lord? But what shall happen when Jesus comes? Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Start with verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so also them which are asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. This we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain coming to the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. He said, But the Lord himself shall ascend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort you one another with these words. Now here's what he's saying. He's saying, I don't want you to be hopeless. Like the world is hopeless. And there is so much hopelessness in this world today. Amen. Wherever we go, people are utterly hopeless. Even young people are fearing a nuclear holocaust. Young people say to me, what is there to live for? This whole world's going to go up in smoke. And what have we got to live for? What is our hope? And what do we know what tomorrow is going to hold for us and what tomorrow is going to bring? But he said, I don't want you to be hopeless. He said, you don't need to sorrow like other people that have no hope. He said, because if you believe that Jesus died, how many believe he died? Raise your hand. And said, if you believe that he rose again, how many believe that he rose again? And he lives and he's at the right hand of the Father on the high. And because he lives, we live also. Hallelujah. And then he rose again. Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. I want to show you something beautiful. When Jesus gets ready to step out from the portals of glory, all of those spirits that have come to be with him. You see, when a man dies, his body returns to the dust and his spirit returns to God who gave it for the Bible. said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If the earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. So they're there. The saints of God are there that have gone on. But when Jesus gets ready to step over the battlements of glory, the spirits of those that are going to be with him will come with him to the air. And they will wait for the bodies to come out of the grave. And they'll enter in those bodies. Hallelujah. And that body that was sown in weakness will be raised in power. That body that was sown in natural body will be raised a spiritual body. That body that was sown in corruption will be raised in incorruption. That body that was sown in dishonor will be raised in glory. Hallelujah. For I will confirm the message again. I will come again. Though there will come scoffers walking after their own lusts, saying, Where is my coming? I will come in the clouds of glory. I will come for the people who are prepared. I will come for the children of light. I will come for them who are looking for me. I will come for them who are watching. I will come in glory and power. I will come that they might be received unto me and gathered unto me so that they may be with me and dwell with me and so shall they ever be with me. 
Would you raise your hand and praise the Lord? I want to tell you, I appreciate the Holy Ghost. I've heard some people say, I didn't get to preach last night because the Holy Ghost took over. I like for the Holy Ghost to take over when I'm preaching. Amen. Amen. I like for him to take over when I'm preaching. And he's here tonight. He's here tonight. And I want you just to breathe a prayer while I'm preaching. God will move through this audience. I believe something miraculous is going to take place in this service tonight. Then he said, this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. In other words, this is not a fable. He said, I'm telling you what came to me by revelation. I'm telling you what came to me by the word of the Lord. That they which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent. That word prevent means precede. Shall not precede them that are asleep. In other words, if you're in the grave, when Jesus Christ comes, those that are alive can't go up before you get up. Amen. Did you hear what I said? If I happen to die, I want you to know this. Before the Lord comes and you're still living, you can't go till I get up. Hallelujah. You can't go until I get up. That's what he's saying now. Oh, let's be God forevermore. For he said, the Lord himself shall descend from the heaven with a shout. Now, it bothers some people that he's going to stop in midair. Somebody said, well, what is he going to stand on, Brother Hughes? Why, that's a silly question. He hung the world on nothing. And I like to say that for the sake of the scientists, you know. They think they're so smart. Well, he hung the world on nothing. The Bible says that the clouds are his chariots. He rides on the wings of the wind. Hallelujah. He made the heavens as a curtain to dwell in. The wind is in his fist. He's going to stand in midair. Praise God. He hung the Lord on nothing, thank God. And over an empty place. And this is what I'm saying. shall descend. I want you to know it's, it's not another. It's that that same Jesus that is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner. Steve, it was that Jesus that walked the sandy shores of Galilee and called the fishermen to follow him. It was that Jesus that talked to Matthew at the receipt of custom, saved that old tax collector and called him to walk after him. It was that same Jesus that went into Gadara and healed and saved that man that had 2,000 demons in him. It was that same Jesus that touched that little woman that had an issue of blood for 12 years and healed her. It's that same Jesus that healed that little boy who had a deaf and dumb spirit and was cast into the fire. It's that same Jesus that stopped the coffin of the widow of Nain and gave her back her son. It was that same Jesus that raised laughter from the dead. It was that same Jesus that which accompany his return. There are going to be 
heavenly signs. The first is, the Lord himself shall descend from the heaven with a shout. That word shout means a command. A command. The second sound is going to be the voice of the archangel. The third sound is going to be a trump. A trumpet sound. There'll be at least two of them, I know, because the Bible speaks of the last trumpet. So there'll have to be a first. And there's going to be three major sounds in the heavens. The Lord Himself shall speak, and the word command, shout, means with a command. He's going to speak, and it's going to penetrate the elements. It'll ring from corridor to corridor in heaven. Hallelujah. Throughout, from ark to ark, throughout the whole earth. It'll not only penetrate the elements, it'll pierce the graves. It'll go right on through the graves. The Bible said in John 5 and 28, Marvel not at this, but the hour is coming when they that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and they that have done good shall come forth to the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. You say, well, Brother Hughes, when he hears that voice, won't everybody come forth? No, you read carefully. It's not the resurrection of the dead, but it's the resurrection from among the dead. Hallelujah. The rest of the dead live not till the thousand years were finished. This is the resurrection of the righteous that's taking place. Praise God. When he gives that voice, the graves will have to offer up their dead. Now my wife tells me that uh, I can split notes right in two. That, uh, well, in fact, when I got married, she gave me one and a half piano lessons. She walked away from me in the middle of the lesson. She said, you're a hopeless case. You know, and a lot of people say I'm the worst singer there is in the church of God. I don't know about that. I've got some little encouragement of late. That there might be one or two worst. But uh, I want to tell you, on that morning, when that voice penetrates the grave, if I happen to be that, I'm going to do as Isaiah said. He said, the dead men shall live, and together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust. For thy dew shall be as the dew of the herbs, and to the earth will cast out her dead. And so he says that I'll ransom them from the power of the grave, and I will redeem them from death. It'll penetrate the grave, it'll penetrate the ocean, it'll penetrate the skies. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. <laughs> and the next sound is going to be the sound of the archangel I don't think it's going to be Gabriel because I believe he's going to be blowing that trumpet so it'll possibly be Michael or Raphael oh Lucifer would have had the chance maybe if he hadn't have fallen <laughs> it'd probably be Michael What's he going to say, Brother Hughes? I think he's going to say, Hallelujah! 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 Because everybody can understand it in every language on earth. And then about that time, Gabriel's going to blow a trumpet. According to Numbers chapter 10, they blew trumpets to awaken or arouse the people for the call, the call, and then another trumpet blast for the gathering. He'll give one trumpet blast and the people will be marshaled. And he'll give the next trumpet blast, and they'll go up to meet the Lord in the air. Hallelujah to God. How beautiful and wonderful. And then he says that dead in Christ shall rise first. When he speaks, you say, Brother Hughes, how can they know his voice? He said in John 10, 13, my sheep know my voice. 
and I've known him my life. Have you ever heard his voice? I heard him say to me when I was nine years old, come unto me and I'll give you rest. I've heard him a lot of times since then. I've heard him speak to me and said, I want you to preach my word. I've heard him speak to me and said, I'll be with you all the way. You go and I'll be with you. You go and I'll stay by your side. I know what his voice sounds like. Have you ever heard his voice? One of these days, you need to have your ear tuned to his voice. The sheep will know his voice and he's known to them. Then he said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In the moment of the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And this, the incorruptible shall put on, uh, the corruptible shall put on incorruption, and the mortal shall put on immortality. So then, when the Corruption hath put on incorruption, and when the mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? And O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be unto God that giveth us the victory to our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. What is he saying here? He is saying that the dead shall be raised raised incorruptible and we shall come forth in the newness of life unto him. Can you say praise the Lord? And then the second thing that's going to take place is a transformation. A transformation. We're going to be changed. Notice the scripture said we should be changed. First John 3 and 2 said, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Do you know what you are now? What is your position? You're a son of God. If you're a son of God, then you're an heir of God. You're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Amen. Brother Ford, adjust your crown on the side of your head. Stand up just a minute. Pull your royal robe about your body. You're a child of the king. You've got a position. You're now a son of God. Hallelujah. But it doth not yet appear what you shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Oh my, I want to be like him. David said in Psalm 17 and 15, As for me, I will behold thy righteousness, and I will be satisfied when I awake in thy likeness. Isaiah said, My eyes shall hold the king in his beauty in a land that is far off. The apostle Paul said, Our conversation is in heaven, from which also we look for the Lord, the Savior, who shall change our vile body, that it should be fashioned like unto his glorious body. That Transformation is coming, neighbor. When we shall be like him, we will have bodies like him. I don't want to embarrass you, brother, but you don't have a limb here right now. And and you're sitting in this chair. You can't get up here and shout like I can. But your flesh is going to be fairer than a child's. Though the skin worms destroy your body, yet in your flesh shall you see God. You'll be a whole him and not another. Praise God for the Lord. Hear what I'm saying. Listen to me, those of you who are troubled and sick in your bodies. This old body has not yet been redeemed. This old body is still under the curse. But one of these days, he sets a with the redemption of the body. sound of abundance of rain.
How is it that you say my coming is far in the distance? And you have allowed yourselves to drift. And you have allowed yourselves to follow me afar off. Why not look unto me and lift up your hearts unto me? For my coming draweth nigh. Behold, now is your salvation nearer than when you believed. Now it is high time to awake out of your sleep and turn to me with all of your hearts. How is it that you will not believe on me? Oh God. For I tried to stir up your pure minds by my word. I tried to quicken your hearts, but you are so bound to this present evil world, and you are so wrapped up with things, and your life is so matted by the things of this life that you have lost vision of me and my glory and my coming. Look unto me, for unto them that look for me will I appear without sin and salvation. I want to tell you tonight, neighbor, God is is trying to do something here. He's trying to do something here in this service tonight. He wants to help you. He's trying to help you. I just want to be sensitive to him. I want to be sensitive to him. For I believe this is the night when the souls can find the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior. The Lord is wanting to do something in the hearts of the people here now. He's wanting to help you. Because when that time comes, 
The saints are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. That's going to be the greatest open air meeting ever known in all of human history.